I've always been interested as an anthropologist in music and as a primatologist specifically interested in percussion because it's it's such a basic cultural um, artifact uh, wherever you go, where, whatever social group you look at. And I've certainly seen many of my primate friends using percussion as a means of ritual and self-expression. Uh, one of the primates I worked with, Kanzi, who was a bonobo, actually got to jam with Paul McCartney and, uh, and also Peter Gabriel. Yeah. And both of them made comments about how that profoundly changed their lives, um, feeling that sense of shared self. Um, and so your work with autistic people, neuroexpansives, um, looking at music as selfhood, can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Well, all right. Should we just uh, jump right in then? So since everybody's here to think about, talk about, feel about, feel better about through music. Um, maybe we'll start with a little bit of music. So I'm just going to play something and um, and then let's just kind of talk about this. So the kind of themes that I want to explore today with you um, are percussion, music more generally, and then personhood, or we might more broadly say, you know, selfhood, identityhood, um, and, and reciprocity. How do we interact with each other? How do we, how do we give and, and take back? Um, how do we make sense of a world through those processes of coming to terms with ourselves and coming to terms with um, each other? Uh, and I think it would come as no surprise to, to any of us to to consider the possibility that, that music is a powerful medium of expression and communication for those kinds of things to happen. So I'm gonna uh, start with um, an example. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, um, but this is an example of a drumming-based uh, ensemble from, from Western Africa. And we'll just listen to it and then uh, maybe just, if you just wanna, however you do it, kind of jot down some thoughts, notes about what you observe, what you feel, how this makes you feel inside yourself, how this makes you feel in terms of, um, you know, projecting outward, um, perhaps to to other uh, beings, other individuals. Um, we'll just talk about that. <laughs>
what do we think is going on there? Any thoughts, any observations? I, I would click next on the video. <laughs> you would click next on the video? You didn't like it, in other words. It was a lot of, like, joy. I don't know. I felt kind of annoying. Like, okay. Know. There's a lot of the repetitive stuff, you know, like. Okay. But, so you, don't, you, you didn't like all the repetition? No, no, I didn't. Okay. It, just, but it, wasn't, it wasn't like any, like, repeat, like, there wasn't any, like, rhythm. I don't know, it was just like a lot of just, you know, just saying the same thing over and over again, just hitting the drums, and there wasn't any, like, real tune to it or anything. So. Okay. Okay, that's, that's a good opinion. I have the opposite response. Uh, I mean, to me, it cuts right through the noise of humanity and goes into that, you know, primal, uh, clean is the word I want to use, mm. that clean place where there's no division between yourself and the people you're with and the environment. Uh, I love the yelling, like almost like people can't even contain it anymore, that mm -hmm. feeling of connection and uh, the dropping of the veil, I guess. Right. And they just they have to whoop, you know, it's um, very primal. I love that. Right. Roger, you, as the, the former, there, there is, former uh, and, pre and future drummer. <laughs> One thing I noticed is, uh, the first thing I noticed is, you know, n there is no sheet music. Nope. You know, so uh, in my experience of it was, um, you know, at at first, it starts to build, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a rhythm to the the drums. Well, I think it started out with vocals first. It did. You know, so then, uh, then the drums are gradually introduced. You know, and wow. then uh, both of those things became intensified as the um, the piece went on, uh, and it I felt kind of sucked in. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I found myself sort of nodding my head, you know, to the beat. To the beat, and, yeah. You know, and anticipating uh, what might come next. Right, right. So, I don't understand the language, obviously, but, you know, there, there, there was sort of a rhythm and a captivation about it, you yeah. know, that, that was not uh, based on understanding the words. You know, it was basically the, the sounds and then the rhythms, you know, that kind of drew me in. Right. Great. So we have three quite different responses, which I would expect. And I don't know if you want to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down or anything. Um, so, so. Okay. I, so, I have one more quick comment. My yeah, own. please. As people were talking, I, I was realizing that it's so participatory. I think mm -hmm. it's sometimes um, unsettling for people, Western people especially, yeah. to be in, in the presence of music that is not sheet music. Yeah, it's uh, You're not a passive observer. You're expected to sort of contribute in some way by movement. Right. Or, and there, anyway, you know, and there's... There are so many layers of mediation that we're dealing with, and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, be a promoter of this band or, or anything. And I don't, I don't know them. I, I have no relationship. This is, and I don't know this tradition super well. This is not my area of ethnomusicological specialization. It's something I've had some experience with this kind of music, but, but you know, I think it would be already a fairly long or fairly far stretch. Um, even if we were to bring in this group, you know, to play a concert and we were all there, say, in a concert hall or something, because it would already be quite divorced from its, you know, original context. Then, you know, we have this other layer where they're performing it for a, a YouTube video that it's not in some kind of a, you know, ritualistic or, or performance kind of situation. It's, it's obviously set up to, to make this video recording. So that's a level of, of distance. And then, you know, we're we're listening it to it and i don't know what kind of speakers i'm guessing Dan is on a walk he's probably listening through a phone so he's not hearing like maybe some of the you know the deep bass tones and the kind of embodied kind of sensibility that this kind of music 
might provide in a different situation. Um, and, you know, and, and we're watching it through these little, you know, these little boxes on a Zoom screen. So we're not, you know, we're not getting a sort of a, a deep context performance of it. And yet at the same time, at least for, for some of you, you know, something of maybe the communicative power, the expressive power of, of what's going on there connects. And I'm just going to talk about a little bit of, of what's going on there um, to see whether, you know, this changes any kind of viewpoint, you know, you might have and, and, and for any of us. So I think it was Roger pointed out, um, maybe Don as well, that it starts off with this vocalization. So there they are all standing with their drums, but they don't drum. For quite a while, they're using their voices. And what they're actually doing is they're setting up the drumming piece by sort of performing a preview of it using their voices onomatopoeically. And so all of those sounds are representative of the sounds to come on the drums. And this makes sense that it's a vocal kind of interaction because the other thing to know about many West African drumming based traditions is that they are language based. The languages in these regions of, of Western Africa are tonal languages. So if I'm talking to you like I am now, English is not a tonal language. Certainly there's tonality to what I'm saying. You know, my voice goes up, my voice goes down, I get a little softer, I get a little louder. Um, you know, I use hand gestures or move my head around to kind of communicate certain kinds of points of emphasis or emotional expression. But the words mean the same thing, even if I just say them like this, right? It means the same thing. Whereas if, if I was using, if I was in a language uh, culture like those people are in, or for that matter, Mandarin Chinese language culture, the tones, and the rhythms of the sounds of the words and the syllables would change the meaning. So if I say akonta in, in the Chui language, which is a different West African language, if I say akonta, that means like, um, it means uncle. But if I say akonta, same exact word, same exact syllables, that means mathematics. Like the, it's an anglicized accounting, akonta. Okay. So, so actually when they're playing the drums, when they're playing the different rhythms and the different tones, and um, it's actually based in language. And so when they're interacting with each other, they are actually speaking with each other. Now they're repeating certain kinds of phrases. So there's like, you know, I'm thinking of another piece uh, from another West African culture and, and it's like a, a, a war song dance. And so they have, you know, this young man and he's, you know, going off to battle and the father is saying, you know, yes, be brave, be courageous. And, you know, and the mother is saying, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo, you know, no, don't go, don't let him go. No, don't go, don't let him go. And the little brother is saying, yeah, he's got to go. I want to go too. And so this whole drama is being played out in this interaction, this language of tones. And the other thing that's happening is that as they're talking, we have all these rules, say, in, in the English language, which are sometimes difficult for people, you know, in different kind of neurodivergent spaces. Like if I'm talking and then suddenly um, Roger were to start talking at the same time, then that would be deemed, oh, well, he's being rude because he's interrupting, right? But actually in, in a lot of these West African language contexts, people can be talking at the same time, but they're able to hear each other and understand each other and move the conversation forward because they're used to, thinking and dialoguing polyphonically. And part of why they're able to do that is because they've been enculturated with these kinds of polyphonic, polyrhythmic drumming traditions. So there's sort of a, a tit and tat, a, a give and take, a reciprocity between drumming as rhythm, drumming as music, drumming as sound, drumming as dance accompaniment, drumming as dance even, and drumming as language, drumming as communication, and similarly, it goes the other way too, that language can be performed as a form of drumming. And so when we sort of listen to this kind of music with that kind of a sense, then those things like that it sounds, you know, completely repetitive and it doesn't seem to really be developing, that can potentially over time change as we change our perception 
you know, our, our perceptual schemes for, for interpreting what's going on. Another thing that's interesting about, um, like I was pointing out, the repetition. So it, it's true that there's a lot of repetition, but if you listen carefully, each time something is repeated, there's some kind of a twist, some kind of a variation, some kind of a development that goes with the repetition. And I remember going to a sermon by a rabbi who was talking about why do we come every Friday evening to Friday evening, you know, Sabbath, Shabbat services, and we do the same prayers every week, every week, every Friday, we do the same, you know, same melodies, same prayers. You know, can't we move on? Can't we get something? But he said, well, no, that's not the point. The point is that each time you do it, and I think the participation aspect that Don pointed out is also important, each time you do it, you go deeper. Each time you do it, you hear something else. You, you're, you reveal another layer of meaning. You sort of embody that sense of what it is more profoundly. Um, it becomes a part of you. And so then by the end of you know the 52 weeks of the year, that prayer is a completely different prayer with a completely different meaning in your life than it was when you did it you know at the beginning of the year and 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 this kind of music this kind of drumming this kind of language works in a similar way and the other thing is that those rhythms those beats that you know Roger was kind of grabbing onto that sort of pulling you in one thing that's really interesting is that they're polyrhythmic so that depending how you hear them and where you hear them starting it completely changes the the perception of it. So I'll give you an example of this. It'll be hard on Zoom, but but I'll try to do it without you know blasting out the sound. So one of the most common rhythms in in certain West African cultures sounds like this: Okay. Um, I'd say we could try it together, but um, that probably won't work very well because of the delay. So we'll, I'll just I'll just demonstrate. So it's 12, 12 beats. Dun dun da dun 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 da dun dun da dun 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 dun. Okay, one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve, and then it repeats. So the one way to feel that is with four main beats divided, each beat divided in three. Dun dun da dun dun dun. Da dun dun da dun 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 da dun. We can notate that in Western notation as being in 12 8. Yep. So the time signature would be 12 over 8, which means you have 12 eighth notes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then you have beats, you know, sounds on some of those beats and not on others. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, right? So one and three have sounds, two and four don't. So bump, bump, ba bump, 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 ba bump, bump. So we'd be going one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three. So twelve eight is a compound quadruple meter. It has four beats with three subdivisions of each of those beats. But the fun thing is. We can then take that exact same rhythm, that exact same sequence of notes and rest, dot, 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 dot. But we can do it as a meter of three with four subdivisions per beat. And what I think you'll find is that it sounds quite different. Dot, dot, do, dot, 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 do, dot, dot, do, dot, 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 do, dot, dot, do, dot, 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 Similarly, if we then move that beat, so we start at a note before, then it becomes don't 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 do don't don't do don't 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 do don't don't do don't, which is different than don't don't do don't 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 do don't don't do don't 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 do don't, which is different again. Now, if we take the second variation and we change that to the meter of three instead of the you know you know three times four instead of four times three. Then that becomes don't 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 do don't don't do don't 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 do don't don't do don't, which again is different than don't don't do don't 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 do don't 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 do don't. So what those 
drummers are doing and the people who are dancing or the people who are listening or the people who are clapping along or whatever, however they're participating, is they're constantly, if they want to, shifting those things. So that what sounds like the same thing over and over again to us can be like 400 different things in the span of a couple of minutes, depending if you just keep moving around, if you keep changing the subdivision, if you keep say, changing where is the first beat of, of, of the measure. And so, you know, we can, I could sit there and I could write all of this down and notate all of it in all the different versions. And people have done that at the music have done that. But I think, you know, the, the bigger point there is that when we, when we can sort of get inside to some extent, a cultural perspective of what's going on in terms of its meaning. So I define my field, ethnomusicology, as the study of how people make and experience music and of why it matters to them that they do. And so, you know, if 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 we're listening to this, if he's listening to this, and he's like, well, hey, I want to listen to something that's that's really interesting, that, that changes a lot, that has, you know, some melody and some harmony that's going to sort of touch me emotionally in the ways that I'm, you know, accustomed to music doing, well, then this music's going to be, you know, pretty dry, pretty boring. Um, and that's and that's fine, because in terms of what, you know, how it matters, this isn't cutting it. So he's, you know, he's pushing the next button. Um, whereas if I'm in the kind of the space where those musicians that we saw in the video are, well, they're, they're having an entirely different kind of, um, sensory experience, an entirely different kind of emotional experience, an entirely different intellectual experience, linguistic experience. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, it's sort of an important lesson in, in, in this idea, you know, what we might in anthropology call cultural relativism, that it's important at least to try to understand, well, what is the perspective that those people are coming to this music from? And does that change our perspective? And if it doesn't, that's fine too. We can still appreciate that that's what it means to them. And we can still go off and say, but I prefer Taylor Swift or I prefer Beethoven or, or what it may be. Oh, I said, I, if I could ground this in neuroexpansivity for a moment. Please do. Uh, I was thinking about how I used to learn words as a little tiny child I get on my tricycle. I was probably two years old. And my grandparents had a circular hallway in the in the first floor of their house. So they'd give me a word at the kitchen table, and I would say it, hippopotamus, 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 all the way around several times, contextualizing that word so that it, it had all these different angles, smells, sights, wow. references. People would just call that echolalia, but to me it was this rhythmic contextualization that was very, very subtle and very complicated. Yep. Which is a yep. cultural, I think, a cultural building block yeah. in autism. Yeah. Well, and I think you know the point you raise is 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 one that I was you know not surprisingly one that I was going to move toward, which is like this idea of echolalia, this idea of repetitive kind of ritualistic even behavior that is often assigned to autistic personhood and and i think one of the important things that say music like what we just heard uh provides is an alternative model in other words if we look at the teleological model of you know western progressive uh you know deterministic uh, patterns of thought leading to certain kinds of conclusions. So, you know, a classical piece, we have a, you know, the exposition and then the development and then the recapitulation where it comes back around after we've had this struggle and this journey through all the stuff, which is great. Um, then, you know, but then that becomes a model of, well, that's how, that's how human enterprise should work. That's how person should, personhood should progress. You know, we should always be developing. We should always be growing and changing and, you know, struggling to, play with the themes so that we can transform them and command them and, and control them until we master them and then bring them back again. Whereas in this other kind of model, it's more what you're talking about with hippopotamus. It's taking that one, that one thing and seeing well, what can we find within that? What can we explore within all of that? How many different ways can we say that? How many different ways can we mean that? How many different ways can it mean us? And and that is an alternative model, which I think is powerful. So in the same way that, 
you maybe as an autistic person would have been scolded or criticized because you were autistic and because you were repeating and repeating and repeating. Similarly, when, when missionaries started going to West Africa or whatever, their assessments were very much like, well, these people are clearly primitive and they, you know, their music is just the same thing and it's not nearly as sophisticated as ours, which means they must be primitive and not nearly as sophisticated as us, which means that, you know, we can control them and we can colonize them and we can enslave them. And we've seen how that, you know, how that went down and, and not very well. And so I kind of feel that in some way there's, there's a natural pairing between ethnomusicology and neurodiversity studies in that both come from a similar place of trying to understand people whose conceptions of what has meaning and what has value in the world, whether it's through music, whether it's through speech, whether it's through language acquisition, um, is, 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 is different from what the mainstream model that a certain kind of, you know, Western enlightenment based uh, culture has, has said we're supposed to follow. And so I feel that the two kind of empower each other. Um, and, and, but, but, but at the same time, I think it's important to realize that it doesn't mean that, oh, well, because, because there's a lot of, you know, repetition in autistic thought processes or linguistic practices, well, therefore all autistic people are going to be drawn to that kind of music. No, you know, it's it there, there's no there's no sort of one to one correlation between these things the the tastes in music that people have autistic or otherwise are just as divergent as as the people that we all are and and they don't map together all right so that's that's one example <laughs> um any other thoughts before we we move on from there if you're just to sample the sounds by say each second yeah uh, it may sound it may appear sort of bland uh, you know, but if you sort of use, I guess, the stuff that preceded that, you know, and then sort of looking forward to trying to predict what, what, how it might play out. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's almost like, um, I don't know, like connecting dots, you know, or like yeah. painting a picture, you yeah. know, so you can have the basic elements by themselves, like say that colors for instance you know the primary colors right um, themselves maybe not that exciting uh but if you think about it in kind of like a time space um mm -hmm. image yeah visual <laughs> then you, you can see this kind of thing really play out uh in having some kind of a, a meaning you know, yeah I'm not sure if i'm explaining that adequately uh, but it, I think it's sort of the kind of back to the echolalia thing is, is uh, sounds or th things have meaning depending on sort of the, the backdrop or the context, right? Exactly. Yeah. The, the stuff themselves uh, maybe uh, appear simple or may seem less significant. So in the echolalia example, you may say, well, that most people might hear that and say, oh, well, you're just repeating the same word, right? And tying back to what you said about the rabbi, <laughs> yeah, it's like those words, the, the word has different meaning depending on the context and where you are, I guess, in space-time. Yep, absolutely. Well, um, I mean, you're, you're right on, on the money. I, I'm, the, the book that I'm working on now, it's, it's actually a textbook for non-music students, and it's called Music colon, context, sound, meaning. Because at some level, it all breaks down to those things. And, and originally it was sound context meaning, but as we started to develop the chapters and things like that, it's really the context almost precedes the sound. It can be done either way, but we decided that as a kind of a pedagogical tool, that would make sense. I mean, it would be interesting. We're not gonna take the time to do that, but I wonder in this case, for example, if I had started by explaining all of those things about the language and the interaction and the changing rhythms and the changing beats, you know, and then we were to listen to it, would it sound different? Would it mean things in a different way, um, even to someone who's removed from that culture? Um, we won't take the time to do the experiment now, but um, but I have found in my teaching that that often, it often does transform students' perceptions from, well, that's, you know, that's boring and it's the same thing over and over again to, wow, there's a lot going on in that. And the more I listen to it, the more I'm kind of, drawn in um 
you know, as, as Roger, I can't remember the, the, the words you use, but you sort of get, you, you know, you, you, you found yourself getting pulled in and maybe you were thinking, well, I don't even know why, because it's the same thing over and over again. But then if you were upon reflection to go back, you would realize, oh, maybe the reason I'm being pulled in is because it's not the same thing over and over again. It's a certain kind of ground that is cyclical, but then what's happening over top of that is deepening and expanding and enriching and, and you know, and inwardly growing as well and the other thing which we haven't even gotten into there which is that we think about um the process the performative process that's happening around all of this and one of the things about classical music like you're saying well it's all written out so if we're you know if we're performing a beethoven symphony well all those notes are written out and so no matter what orchestra plays it you know it'd be the chicago symphony the berlin philharmonic the you know, the Podong Youth Orchestra, I mean, they're basically going to be playing those same notes. Um, the accuracy of, of, you know, how well they play them and, and the interpretation, you know, there's a lot of difference there. So I'm not saying that it's like play by numbers, you know, or connect the dots, you know, in, in a kind of a very utilitarian way. But there is a certain sense in which the, the design, the plan, what the music is going to be, where it's going to go, has already been determined by the composer. And, and will be shaped in performance by how the conductor then, you know, moves us, you know, along along the, the train tracks of, of that composition. Uh, never thought about that a conductor on a train or, or of an orchestra. They're, they're, they're both moving along those train tracks. Whereas one thing that, that I didn't mention here is that one thing that this kind of um, repetitive structure makes possible is improvisation. Because you have this thing that is there that that can be to some extent predicted that that same you know gong 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 timeline is going to keep being there then you as a performer have the opportunity to create your own to create your own interaction of it to create your own reciprocity with that so you have on the one hand this building up of these webs these polyrhythms where there are these what are called ostinatos these repeating rhythmic patterns in the drum parts if there are bell parts um, that kind of form this intricate, you know, almost like a, a spider web of, of rhythmic interaction. But then as you listen to that and weave in and out of it, whether you're drumming, whether you're dancing, whether you're clapping, you get to choose. It's like an, it, it's, it's like a, it's like an interactive video game. You know, you get to choose your adventure and there are certain rules, just like in a video game that, you know, if, if you, if you step outside the lines, then you get a, you know, <laughs> you get a penalty or you lose points. But is if you can kind of just stay inside those lines, but keep pushing the boundaries, that's how you win points, you know, in a video game. And that's how you that's how you enrich the depth of musical experience in, in a drumming based concept um, piece like that. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot more going on maybe than than first appearances would suggest. So now I'm going to play you another piece that is from Bali, from Indonesia. And this one similarly will be based on some pretty clearly marked um repeating things ostinatos right so we're going to have this gong cycle it's going to go gong 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 if only i'd been able to pick up my gongs from the airport today i could do a wonderful demonstration of that okay um and then you have a certain like a tempo keeping instrument that's giving you a steady beat and then you have certain standard patterns that are played on the cymbals, certain standard patterns that are played on the drums. And if you listen to the really old ceremonial style of this music, that would pretty much be it. And that probably would be pushing next right away. But in this piece, in this piece, they've taken that foundation and they've turned it into this very flashy virtuosic contest style with tremendous like, you know, kind of pyrotechnic uh, drumming patterns and cymbal interactions and interlocking patterns and, 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 and also with this very carefully choreographed dancing and they perform this kind of music in contest. So it's there is a panel of judges that's deciding which group is doing it best, which group is not doing it best. And so I'll be interested um, in your opinions of, of this piece as a kind of a vamping off of, of the one that we just listened to a minute ago.
with you on that this so yeah. this unlike the first piece this is my area of specialization i actually wrote a entire book on that particular kind of music so yeah. I spent many many years trying to you know get inside of all that it, it's it's yeah it, and the first time i heard it that was my response too because i was actually in bali and yeah. i had lots of other music from that island of different kinds but i'd never yeah. heard this kind and then we just i was in a jeep and and there was like this ritual off to the side of the road and these, yeah. these guys were playing that kind of music and i just told the the you know the taxi driver just says stop and i just jumped out and i said what because yeah. <laughs> it just really drew me in um and if you hear it like live there you know with really the big don't. deep gongs yeah. and everything it's just it just like it just goes right into your heart you know it's, it's a yeah. very powerful sound it absolutely is parade music and now here's another fun twist so this is competition parade kind of thing but the foundational music that this modern style comes from is for cremation processions, processions for the dead. Mm. And so what they're doing actually is, so the music is much simpler in the cremation, traditional cremation style. And you have that gong cycle that just repeats over and over. And then you have the drums coming in and out, bringing the cymbals in and out. And essentially what's happening there is rather than it all being arranged and work out like this with choreography, it's just the drummer is paying attention. So you've got this body or the remains of the body of the dead person in this tower and this long white cloth that represents, it's called the lunching on. And it represents like, you know, that the trail of this, of this cloth is going up to the upper world where the gods and the deified ancestors live. But meanwhile, you have all of these evil spirits from the underworld who are trying to get into the tower to steal the soul of the dead, to drag it down to the underworld. And the people who are in the middle world, they're trying mm. to protect the soul. And so that music is actually believed to be like a weapon that's being used against the evil spirits. So when they hear those crashing cymbals, um, they get they get scared and they and they, it, it deflects <laughs> them. It's almost like a, a sonic shield. Also, when they 
get to the crossroads, which is where the evil spirits are believed to dwell in greatest abundance, they spin the tower, the cremation tower with the soul of the deceased inside of it at top. Um, they spin it at least three times and the music gets super energetic at those points and the rhythm changes because what they're actually doing is when they spin that tower, all those evil spirits that are flying in and trying to get into the tower to drag that soul down, they can only travel in straight lines. And so when they spin the tower, it confuses them and deflects them. So there's this whole sort of kinesthetic, sonic power that's happening in this battle um, between between human and and spirit forces, spirit forces of the upper world, of the gods and ancestors, spirit forces of the lower world, of the demons, and so on and so forth. And it's all being played out um, in this kind of drama with that kind of music as a very important uh, uh, functional aspect of what's going on. So that's, um, yeah. Other thoughts about, about uh, that piece? I had a... And interestingly, an opposite reaction, uh, that it was too much for me. Yep. Like I, I think generally on a sensory level, I need, I need somewhere to anchor yep. and it can get really, you know, crazy and participatory on top of that. Yep. If you're starting and stopping. That's more difficult for me to, to navigate. And again, all of these things, you know, the way music becomes meaningful to us as people who maybe have no background in this kind of music, this kind of culture, absolutely flex. Because what's happened is since the time in 1986, when they essentially invented this neo-traditional genre of contest Bologna music, drawn from the more simple, ritualistic, repetitive cremation music, it's gotten more and more and more and more complicated, less and less grounded, less and less group. So this, what we just listened to, that's like 2005. Since that time, it's just continued to get crazier and crazier. And they're adding dancers and like there's almost no gong cycle at all. And they're changing the meters every two seconds. And, and, and now the, the people, the young people in Bali, they go crazy for this. They love it. But for me, even like listening to some, it's just like, it's like you, I got nothing to grab onto. This isn't Bella Gondra anymore to me. Yeah. Like my teacher, who's like, you know, would be in his mid sixties now or something like that. He's like, Bella Gondra, you know, kind of had its golden age around, you know, the, 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 the mid, you know, the early to mid 1990s. And then since then it's kind of been in decline because it's just lost touch with its roots. He can't get a handle on it because it's changing so quickly. And so again, what does it mean if it's for a competition? It means one thing. If you're trying to do all flash and excitement, this is very good. But if you want to ground in it, if you want it to sort of speak to the ancestors, maybe not so good. Now there's a crisis in Bali, and there has been for a long time, because the music, like I described it in the old ritual style, it was all about the lead drummer figuring out what's going on. Are the people too anxious? Are they too lethargic? Okay, we'll bring up the temple, we'll bring down the temple. It's all about function, making sure that everything worked so that the gods would be happy, the demons would be, you know, fended off, the cremation would be successful, and the spirit would ascend to the upper world to await reincarnation or to await liberation from the entire cycle. Now what happens is in order to keep the kids interested in playing the music, they go ahead and they play the contest style, but they play it in the cremation ceremonies. And so they get to that crossroads, the intersections, where it's supposed to be the high energy driving rhythm, and they're playing like the slow stuff, like we heard at the end, the little more melodic stuff. And that's not, you know, going to get the job done. That's not going to scare any evil spirits. And so I asked the greatest, you know, the greatest Balinese composer of the 20th century, who was like one of my gurus, you know, my teacher's teacher and the father of one of my teachers. I interviewed him about all of this. And, and I said, and he was like complaining, saying, yeah, now it's no good. You know, we do the cremations and I'm frightened that you know, the, the souls are gonna get dragged to the underworld because the kids, you know, they get to the intersections and they just play the slow music because that's how they learn it in the contest style. And, I, and I'm and i like, dude, you know, well, you know, you're know, you Pak Brata, you know, you're you're the man, like, can't you, can't you influence what they do? And he's like, you know, kind of plants his head in his, his, his hand and he's like, well, you know, we're, we're desperately trying to keep the tradition and the culture alive. We're trying to keep the younger generations in it they get excited by the new style, the new contest style. And so, you know, we just let them play however they want to. The, and, and basically he said, 
something to the effect of, you know, better to gamble on the um, on the benevolence of the gods than the fickle fancies of youth, that the gods will understand, they'll accept it. But if we huh. if we try to tell the kids what to do, they'll just leave and they'll just, you know, go out to the dance clubs and, you know, drive their motorcycles or whatever they do. So, you know, all these things kind of become meaningful in, in different ways as far as intergenerational relationships, cultural resilience, cultural transformation, how far, you know, again, like we we're talking about improvisation, how far are we willing to bend? How far are we willing to bend culture? How far are we willing to bend concepts of appropriate language performance, of appropriate social performance? How much are we willing to accommodate in neurodiversity? How much are we willing to accommodate in musical development while still holding on to what, you know, what is precious and dear to us that sort of binds us together as, as cultural beings? Yeah, definitely a very different experience than the first piece. I was trying to sort of make sense of what was going on. Um, Good luck. I've been working on that for 30 years and I'm still trying to make sense of it. <laughs> well, you know what? That, so so the conclusion that that I that made the most sense to me is that this this music accompanies a performance or there's a story. You know, because um, I could see, and what came to my mind was like, you know, if you're watching a ballet or something like that, uh, you know, the the music, you know, th there's things that happen in the music that correspond to the story or the yeah. visual, uh, and that that piece sounded like there was like a clash <laughs> of different things going yeah. on. Uh, and it's funny because when when, when you said that you, know, you were describing what it meant with you know the spirits and uh, trying to deflect, uh, run interference of the spirits, don't uh, pull away, uh, or demons don't pull away someone's spirit. It yeah, that fits with uh, what I was hearing because what I was hearing was that it, it sounded like a clash, like a battle of some sorts. Yep. Uh, and yeah, and that situation unlike the first situation you know there, there was a lot of uh, you know dancing and people were wearing costumes uh so it, it seemed like um that the the music was really sort of telling a story in the right. second piece yes in the second yeah, piece. yeah yeah right. well right. Uh, again I'm, I'm just always amazed at how perceptive people are when when encountering something that you know, for the first time, because um, the entire metaphor of that music is battle. And it's it's a sort of a duality of battle concepts, because on the one hand, you know, going back however many, you know, centuries, millennia, whatever, this kind of music in its more simple stripped down form has been that music of the cremation ceremonies and the battles between the different worlds, the upper and the middle and the lower world. But then also for hundreds of years before the contest style, that music became the music of literal human battles. In other words, just as we had in the, you know, like the Revolutionary War and they'd be soldiers would be accompanied by their by their bands, you know, going into battle. And and the, the power of the sound of, of the drums and the trumpets and everything, you know, was supposed to, you know, we, we are some badasses here. You know, we got a big army and we're, we're tough. And, and it's the same idea here. So the, the, the armies would be accompanied into battle by, at least this is our, what we're able to piece together, you know, historiographically, um, by their Belagondre gamelons. And, and so because those, that kind of music had always been associated with, with rituals of death, it seemed appropriate that it would be uh, in, in, in this sort of war, you know, literal war context. And that power of the gongs at the low end and the clashing, the, the, the physical, literal clashing of the symbols at the high end sort of created an entire spectrum of power sound, of mm -hmm. aggression. This music traditionally has only been performed by men because it's associated with that kind of martial aspect and because it's associated with spiritual battles that women are traditionally not supposed to be involved with in the in the early 1990s they started having women's groups play this music and i stumbled upon this because i had been doing my research through the mid to late 1980s and then i'd been gone for a couple of years and i came back 
And before I had gone, there had been one group that had experimented with having a couple of women in the group and it created this huge scandal. And all my teachers were like, this is a disgrace. You know, this is, you know, abhorrent and this could never happen again. And then I come back, you know, two, three years later, and there's like all these women's Bologna groups and they're playing at, you know, political rallies. And I'm like, what, you know, what happened? And, and here I had a good plan for finishing the research for my book and the whole thing was sort of blown out of the water, right? Um, well, what, what had happened was it wasn't an organic development at all. It was that the government, which unbeknownst to me at the time was about to collapse this authoritarian, authoritarian regime was pushing this on the Balinese and saying, we want you to have women play this very male, masculine, martial, you know, spirit battle kind of music to show how emancipated our country is, to show how we value women and and women's you know emancipation um and so it was creating this this huge tension where the you know the the sort of the cultural standards of balinese um, morality and ethics and ritual and religion were being compromised but that there was pressure on them to do this and it was and it was fulfilling some kind of a nationalist goal yet there was also resentment to this government which was on the verge of collapse and there was also the fact that the women who were playing the music and the girls who were playing the music were getting a kick out of it because it was fun to play this, you know, this kind of really male music that had always been um, forbidden for them. And so I ended up, you know, writing a, a chapter of, of the book dealing with all of this kind of thing. But but this idea of, of battle, um, you know, runs through it. And so then you have this other layer where there's this concept of kapalawanan, means heroic spirit. And all of that choreography you see in the contest style, all of those moves are either mimicking different kinds of martial maneuvers, which have become sort of standardized in the dance vocabulary, Balinese dance, or parodying those. So there's an element of satire built in too. And again, there's this line, how far can you go and kind of poking fun at it before you cross that line and it's considered you know, irreverent to the point where you get disqualified. And, and we've seen that happen too. So you have all these different layers. You have, you know, the sort of the base layer of this ritualistic music for cremation ceremonies, battles between different spirit levels, different worlds, the martial aspect of it, um, you know, different uh, warriors, traditions of walking warriors. That's what Balaganjar essentially means, um, you know, clashing with each other in actual battle, representing the kinds of heroic warriors of old. And then you have the, you know, the war within the war within the war which is how do we represent how do we sort of rectify a past that in some ways we embrace but in some ways we've moved on from with a present that sort of animates all of the tensions and dualities inherent in, in such things so it's a pretty it's a pretty complex form so that's that's why i've spent a lot of years trying to figure it out but you you know you you hit right at it you know just and, and that's that's i think a beautiful example of the power of music. So all of you, all of you hit something fundamental, right? Hit something fundamental about, wow, this is exciting. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of dynamism. You know, there's a kind of a groove to it, yet there's constantly things changing. Well, that's what appeals to the young people in Bali who, who come to these contests in, in the thousands. Dawn picked up on another reality, which is, yeah, but if it's going that flashy and that fancy, there's a fundamental groove. There's there's that thing that that you know that weekly sermon, the, the the prayer that I want to be able to sort of dig into week after week and go deeper and deeper. But I can't pay attention because it's because the stuff's going by too fast and it's changing too much. And that's that's you know a, a, a sentiment that a lot of especially older people, and I would say myself included, have about the direction that Bologandra has gone. You know, in the past couple of decades. And then there's Roger's perception that whatever it is, however it's coming through. There's something about a drama here. There's something about a representation of, of, of an ancient era, of a kind of a, a, an idealized past, and in, in that idealized past is a past of warriors and chivalry and, and martial endeavor and battles and wars and heroes. And, and, and all of that is built into the music, both on the spiritual plane and on the human interactional plane. And there's also this aspect of the Kapalawan on spirit and similar to our ideas of chivalry, that yes, these are warriors. Yes, they're fighting. Yes, they're killing. There's all kinds of horror in war, but there's a certain honor in it too. And there's a certain kind of 
you know, rising above that in a certain, you know, almost godlike grace that goes with the noble warrior. So all of these things are 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 built, you know, they're they're hardwired into that music. They're baked into the sound. They're baked into the rhythm. They're baked into the design. Fascinating. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about because you've you've made music with so many autistic and neurodivergent people. Yep. Um, I don't want to oversimplify, but it, it seems like reflected in music that quote neurotypical culture has a lot to do with the goal of perfecting a smooth path to the like a predetermined point. Whereas yeah. for tribal people, again, I don't want to, you know, overgeneralize right. autistic people, whatever. The goal is more about providing a shared space where full participation and self-expression can blossom. Yeah. I don't I, I was gonna just turn that over to you to talk about like what, what you've seen working with autistic people, like how they express that. Well, I just so happened to have another video that I was hoping I might have time. Um, and if you will indulge me to share one more example, I think it would be a beautiful place to close. Uh, and Don, you might have even seen this one before. So this is the Artism Ensemble uh, from two, about 10 years ago. Um, and it's a, um, a young woman, uh, I guess a girl at that time. Uh, actually, I just saw her a couple of days ago at a concert, strangely enough. Um, but she goes by the pseudonym ES in, in all the Artism Ensemble publications and whatnot. And um, so she was a member of the Artism Ensemble for three years and basically until the third year, never played a note. She would come to the rehearsals and she would, um, she would listen and she would usually sit facing away from the rest of the group. And there were all these percussion instruments, but she wouldn't play. She would usually cover and uncover her ears and face away. She always had to sit next to her mother, um, that, you know, to feel comfortable. Um, but that was her experience, and, and kind of the the rules of the ensemble were that that was okay. You know, however she chose to participate was fine. And so for like two and a half years, that was that was how it was. Um, and then we got in this situation where one day. She showed up uh, with her mom at rehearsal and she had a box, a wooden box that was painted yellow and purple, which she had painted herself. And she had two coffee cans. And her mother said to me, uh, so ES has decided that she now wants to play with the group, but that she will only play her piece and she will only play the instruments that she made, this box and these coffee cans. And I was delighted. I said, absolutely, you know, bring it on. And so, you know, we did this piece and she had a name for the piece and it was called Jubai. Now, there's another very important aspect to the story, which is that we would do this rehearsal and she would not participate in, you know, the conventional way. Um, she would again be facing away from the group, covering her ears. But then, by her mother's report and by my own experience later working with her at her home, she would then go home and she would have all these pots and pans and tabletops and counters and uh, stools and she would play like unbelievable stuff and her mom would record it. It was like, you know, it was like listening to like some incredible, you know, jazz drummer playing a drum solo or something. Like she was like, like, like incredibly virtuosic and incredibly sophisticated compositions. So she was, she was processing a tremendous amount in the rehearsals, which were giving her inspiration to then go and, and do this other kind of thing. But then she comes in and she does this thing, you know, where she plays with us. And then eventually, um, and we're going to sort of pick the midpoint in this, in this story. But after what we're going to see in the story, a couple months later, we went on to do this big uh, performance of the Artism Ensemble at the Society for Disability Studies Conference which was in Orlando that year, which where I am today was very appropriate. Um, and, and one of the, the kids in the group was not able to make the trip. And he was like one of the, you know, very kind of exhibitionistic fun, you know, player. And, and so we were one person down 
And so I, you know, explained this to the rest of the group at the, you know, one of the rehearsals leading up to it. And I said, and then I said to ES, I said, ES, I, I know and respect that you, you know, you've sort of set your terms that you will only play your piece and you'll only play your box and your can. But we're one person down and I'm just wondering, just putting it out there, if you're willing to consider it, would you consider playing in the other pieces as well? And she just thought about it for a sec. And then she looked at me, she looked me in the eyes instead of looking at her mother. And she said, yes, I'll do that. <laughs> and sure enough, she did. And then she played in concert. But unlike a kind of a, you know, neurotypical happy ending narrative that that could generate, I don't see this as, as an arc of improvement, as a teleological progression. I see this simply as three different ways that ES participated beautifully in the group. First, as a listener who then went and did her own thing in her, in her home. Then as a specialist who had a composer who had her piece and her instruments and worked with the ensemble in that context. And then as an ensemble player who engaged in performance with, with the rest of the group. All of those were fun. So we're going we're gonna to pick up that story in this performance in the middle. And rather than just play it for you and then ask you what you think, this time I'm going to tell you what I think. And I'm going to see what you think. Um, so what happens in this piece? So it's a completely improvised kind of ensemble. And the idea is that each kid, we take turns, they are the composer of their piece. They direct the ensemble of, during their piece. And that wasn't something that I came up with or any other uh, adult musician in the group. That was something that when we formed the group and when I you know, explained what the group was gonna do that we were gonna play performances, one of the kids named Coffee Bot said, well, if we're going to do that, we better do some really good quality music. This isn't just going to be playing around. And, 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 and they said, and, you know, we want to make our own pieces. And so they completely took, you know, took agency to define the group dynamic. Our job, my job and the job of the other professional musicians in the group from all over the world, from Trinidad, from Bolivia, from, from uh, Cuba, uh, Peru, um, was to be there at their service. So wherever they did, wherever they went, whatever they did, we had to follow them, even if that meant looking incompetent, even if that meant having the beat fall out, whatever it was, it was their gig. And so what happens in this piece is especially interesting because ES sets the groove. And she does that on, you know, on her coffee cans, box and stuff like that. And then you'll hear like the guitar player sort of picks it up and did it in king 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 and the flute player then comes on with long tones and it sort of builds up and it's like wow this is really developing into this really nice composition as as the different players sort of build off of that basic you know um embryonic theme of 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 es's part but then just as it's kind of really gelling es turns the beat around she makes quote unquote what sounds like a mistake and the whole thing gets turned upside down. Now, it would be very easy for any of the professional musicians in this group to sort of write the ship, to kind of use, you know, our, you know, musical authority to, to get it back on the beat, to get it back right. But because that is against our, you know, our policy, instead, it just kind of noodles around for a while in this kind of liminal place where it, the groove falls out and it just kind of seems chaotic. And then at a certain point, flute player kind of picks something else up and then it comes back into the groove but now that same rhythm is it's completely turned upside down now was this intentional we'll never necessarily know because es wouldn't say but months later i learned that one of the things es used to delight in when she grew up in france she had a piano teacher was she would intentionally screw things up to see if the piano teacher could adjust to go with her. So it could be that she just lost the beat and we you know, kind of found a new place to find it. Or it could be that she absolutely knew what she was doing. She absolutely wanted to put us to the test and see how good of musicians we really were as to whether we could follow her. So that's my interpretation. Let me play for you the piece. And then uh, if we have a few more minutes to get your yeah, you can tear up everything I say and come say I'm full of nonsense or or whatever. We'll see what you come up with. So that's ES in the pink and white shirt. This is her mother. And then you'll see uh, various other kids in the group and then the professional musicians who are 
who are older and and then also the parents. So it's like a 20 man or 20 person, I should say, group um, of range, you know, full range from world class um, musicians to, you know, kids um, and parents who are, have no musical background to speak of at all. Did you, did you hear how that happened? How it was sort of together, then it kind of felt all kind of blah, 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 and then it kind of felt back together again, like a three part form, but then it was turned upside down in, in the last little part. Yeah, so. it reminded me a lot of the ethnography itself, actually. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I came in with um, all these, you know, kind of set ideas about how, how we would, how it would run. And then people just, invented it from the inside out yep. mm -hmm. uh, in a very democratic way and yep. it became better than the thing i had in mind of course mm -hmm. funny how that always happens right yeah um, if you let it only if you let it if you let it yeah if you let it which is sort of you know um comment on on how autistic people i think rather than being gadflies you know can be that impetus to change yeah. the way that we do things generally, uh, yeah. which is clear, you know, the things that aren't working. Yeah. Uh, so I have seen that clip before and I have always enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. I guess tying it back to the, the previous pieces we've listened to, uh, is this, does this have similarities to the first piece with the drumming? You know, and I guess in the sense that there's this, seems like there's, maybe some kind of a back and forth between the the performers and people are trying to sort of make a maybe they're they're trying to make it cohesive uh so there's they're adjusting in real time I suppose. yeah yeah i mean i think i think that's a that's a fair comparison you know obviously the difference in in that that first group the west african group you know that was a very polished rehearsed performance of oh okay okay you know of, of people who had a lot of a lot of practice and experience and expertise um in that tradition whereas here i mean well one could say <laughs> within the artism tradition these people have a lot of expertise too but there would i would say that um like the kind of thing that happened there where, where the where the beats kind of gets turned around and there's all that kind of fuzziness in between that wouldn't happen with the first group because they would just, you know, they would just auto correct it because it's just almost like, and, and, and if we had the same musicians in the, in the artism ensemble, 
but without the kids and without their parents, if it was just the professional musicians, then that wouldn't happen either. We would push and we would, you know, challenge each other, but there would always be these very clear, you know, markations of, we know where the beat is, we know what the chord changes are. And, and in fact, if you just, if you, there was the band within the band, the professional musicians, were another band called Omni Musica, which was my group at the university uh, back at that time, which, you know, put out recordings and we, you know, we were first ballot entry for a Grammy and all this kind of stuff. So there's, there's a lot of things, but in some ways, playing in the artism ensemble was more challenging because we all had to sublimate our egos and we all had to learn in real time to adjust to things that defied any of our expectations. It would be like, well, I mean, it would be like if, if you're if you're in conversation with someone who speaks your language, you know, very fluidly and you, there's so much that you assume. Whereas if you talk to someone who's coming from, say, a, a neurodivergent perspective, whose language practice is different, whose prosody is different, who, you know, who, who is using stimming as a kind of a, a mode of expression as opposed to maybe, well, maybe this is stimming what I do. But um but it would be, you know, you, you have to you have to be adjusting more in real time. So I think I think in some sense, there is a lot of similarity in that we're taking some fundamental ideas, a fundamental rhythm, and we're building layers upon that through different ostinatos and variation and improvisation. Both of those pieces have that in common. Um, but then there's a difference because, the, you know, at least presumably, we're not dealing with the sort of the neurodivergence and we're not dealing with the distinction between people with very extensive musical training and people with virtually no musical training, all, you know, trying to find common space within, within the same ensemble. Okay. So, so just to clarify the, the first piece with the uh, West African music, that, yeah. that is all rehearsed in, uh, so that performance was not improv basically. Well, no, it, it's it's a little more complicated than that. So the piece was rehearsed. The basic structure and form and the markers of, you know, what the different sections will be are largely predetermined, are largely composed, essentially. Mm -hmm. But once that framework is established, there's a tremendous latitude for improvisation, similar to the difference between a classical piece and a jazz piece you know, or certain kinds of jazz, right? If you're thinking like a bebop jazz piece or something where, where different people are taking soul. So, you know, the basic groove is established. The drummer is laying that down. The bass player is giving, you know, walking bass, piano player is comping. There's a standard chord progression. The bar, you know, it's 32 bar form or whatever it is. But then once, once that foundation is already kind of agreed upon, the individual musicians can do a lot of improvisation and a lot of interactional, you know, reciprocal exchange. That's more akin to what we heard in that in that first piece. Whereas the Balinese piece is more like a classical piece, even though they it, they don't notate it. That piece is pretty worked out. Like there's 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 very little improvisation there. There are a few spots where the drummers, you know, have certain patterns that they do improvisation within. But that's really a composition. It's like it's going to be pretty much played the same way, you know, every time they do it. Okay. Yeah. So, it's, so it's, there's a continuum happened. between improvisation and composition, but um, but composition is never completely lacks an element of improvisation, and even the most fully improvised music always has some element of composition to it, because if nothing else, if in in total free improvisation, which is something I do a fair bit. Um, there's there's some kind of an effort to defy the usual expectations of what a conventional forum would present. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is that, I guess that spirit is reflected in, I guess, what you just showed us. Um, yeah. The, the girl uh, sort of defying expectation. Uh, right. And, 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 and the parallel goes further. Similarly, like if I'm playing in a free jazz context, uh, which I do a lot, um, playing with, you know, very, very high level musicians in, in the, in that tradition. Sometimes there'll be things I do and it's all happening in real time and there is no roadmap, you know, other than whatever, other than the, you know, hundred odd years of collective experience that we bring to that moment. But, but sometimes I'll try something and it doesn't work out. You know, my hands just don't do what 
what my brain is telling them to do. And, 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 and I have a choice. I can move on to that or I move on from that or I can lean into it. And sometimes I do one, sometimes I do it. So sometimes if I, if I make a mistake, I'll then lean into it and I'll keep making that mistake over and over again. And we'll build up an entirely new groove based on, on, on the foundation of, of that mistaken rhythm. One interpretation, one possibility of what ES is doing is something like that. You know, so, she, you know, she knows she, you know, she was moving the coffee can, the rhythm kind of changed, but rather than try and self-correct or let someone else correct her, she kind of just lets us sit in the stew of the uncertainty and the unpredictability of the moment until the thing comes back into a sort of a collective order, but, but turned on its head, turned upside down, quite literally, and, you know, which, which might be some kind of an interesting metaphor for, you know, neurodiversity <laughs> writ large. Yeah. I'm wondering in your experience with um in this project, uh, I guess we're talking about ES specifically. I'm kind of curious about how maybe some of the other kids or maybe adults that you've worked with, yeah, you know, how is this some kind of a um, like communication or some kind of a shared kind of experience or some kind of reciprocal interaction yeah. that is kind of plays out in the form of music versus say language yeah well that's that's a big big question and as dawn knows i've 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 wrestled with that question a lot in 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 my publications and talks and things and things we've done together too i would say the simple answer is yes <laughs> um so let me just kind of you know hit on a couple of points related to that one thing i think that's really important for me to profess is that you know there's a lot of essentialism and a lot of stereotyping of autistic people um you know sort of old school thinking um lacking emotion or at least lacking the capacity for emotional expression lacking empathy lacking humor you know all these absences and what i found in you know many years of playing music with autistic people and, and now i'm into a whole new phase where um you know my new projects are working with like recognized master musicians who are autistic one being matt savage um genius uh jazz pianist um based in boston um and another being jennifer masumba who's this incredible singer songwriter um and so that's i mean that's maybe a project you know for next year's talk or something we can we can get that but but it, at all these different levels i find you know and again i at the risk of you know over generalizing but if i had to pick on the level of kind of depth of emotional expression and depth of empathy within musical interactive context contexts the autistic musicians are at a higher level, whether they're these kids in the artism ensemble or whether we're talking about Matt Savage or Jennifer Masumba, that there's there's a certain kind of empath, you know, empathetic or empathic, whichever word, I don't know, um, capacity um, and 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 a willingness to sort of go there with that capacity that many of my um, you know non-autistic uh, colleagues don't have now there are exceptions to that too um this particular trio that i've been kind of alluding to the free jazz group um with with this actually it's the bass player who you saw with the little baby on his lap his name's brian hall he's a great jazz bass player and it's a trumpet player multi-instrument launch new parsons and we have that when we play together it's just always like that it's just it's just like there's this kind of empathy this esp this kind of willingness to just sort of go wherever you know, wherever the thing takes us. But very often in other situations, I, you know, playing with really great musicians who I have, you know, the world of respect for. Um, but that thing, that that empathy, that sort of deep sense of, of having that sort of inner comprehension of being able to sort of be inside another person's head, mind, heart, soul. Um, I found that sometimes that's deeper with, with autistic people. I find Dawn actually, you know, I'm not, I don't want to sing it, but, but, but that's something that I've always 
valued about my friendship with Don is they're just things that, you know, things that are going on and, and I'll, and Don, you know, I won't have seen her for like five years and she's never even met these people. And the second I sort of, you know, kind of lay out the scenario, she's well, oh, well, of course, because, and, you know, and it's like, oh, well, that's the insight that I've been looking for that, that nobody else has really come to. I mean, I was just thinking that, um, I, I think through the ethnography, uh, and, Don has pointed out multiple times that um, you know this idea of you know, theory of mind and you know, empathy, uh, this this stereotype that that's somehow uh, you know lacking in autistic people, uh, and Nonsense. That's really not the case at all. You know, if oh, you, no. it, it's just you know uh, it, people people connect with each other you know in in different ways. So yeah, if they think about it as like. I guess maybe the simplest uh, comparison might be like a language or something like that. You know, just because you don't understand a language doesn't mean that you're incapable of right. communication. Um, hey, very good. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So, so the, so in this, I guess, I guess music has so many different purposes. You know, some. I mean, I think I alluded to early. You can listen. You just you can relax to it. You know, if you can just go cruising in a car and listen to music. But then there's music that tells a story and then you know there, there's music that you know can help you you know feel part of something or uh being in sync with other people you know yeah. which is a different kind of you know reciprocity and connection than say yeah. you know, people hanging out at, at a coffee shop yeah. um you know and i kind of wonder if um if, if people maybe language is really not their preferred means of connecting with folks, you know, but if they connect through sort of music, uh, then this could be, I could see it being such a tremendous opportunity. And I think, you know, the um, video you showed, well, I keep on going back to that West African video because I had a reaction to it, you know? So the, mm -hmm. so when, when you hear that, and you know, this is just hearing it on YouTube, you know, it, it kind of sucks you in gradually, right? Yep. And then it develops, you get this rhythm in your head, which is in sync with the rhythm uh, <laughs> that's being played by this this group, right? Yeah. And then you feel kind of a connection to that. And maybe uh, that's probably why people like certain performers. Are, All right, well, if you can give people who maybe connect with others in a less, in, in more of a, untraditional way mm -hmm. you know more opportunities you know to or options you know to connect with folks you know if more people were say trained in music you know who were say neurodivergent you know would that in and of itself be a very robust way for someone to feel a sense of connection and community uh and i'm wondering in, in your project if that's also if you've you know you, something you've, you've observed well, I, 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 I'm going to say I agree with everything you said, but there was one word in there that I'm going to take, you know, push back against, which is I don't know that it necessarily requires that people be trained in music. Mm -hmm. I think I think what my work has been about for a long time now in, in, in this area has been kind of the opposite. Um, that I think if we provide musical opportunities, musical spaces, spaces where music can happen. And we don't demand a certain kind of what inevitably tends to move toward a kind of a neurotypical, very rigid standard about, you know, what that training involves, what competence involves, what expertise involves, what acceptable behavior involves, whether bodily conduct, you know, musical sound, whatever. Um, then we have a chance now there are wonderful autistic musicians who are you know right in the right in the pocket in in classical music training and of the highest order and you know more power to them and and and, and that's great i mean matt savage would certainly fall into that category um but i think the other the other side of it is that um if we kind of turn the whole thing upside down again you know maybe like es did um and we say or oh, how about this how about this folks how about we all come together in this room 
and we put all these instruments out with no rules other than that we have to respect each other and not physically harm each other. Um, and let's see what happens. And, and then we further, you know, push the envelope by saying, and the people who get to make kind of the decide the decisions about the direction that the music takes, the people who get to take the leadership roles are maybe these kids who are not trained musicians who are autistic and the people who have to sort of listen and take instructions from those kids are these, you know, highly credentialed professional musicians. What kind of music would that, you know, yield? What kind of experience would that yield? What kind of reciprocity? What kind of social, you know, gains? And and that's really what that's really what the artism ensemble is about. And and I think it worked. <laughs> you know, I mean, we we made some great music, and and I think in every case, in different ways, these kids were, you know, and their parents who were totally different from each other, and the professional musicians came out of that project as you know as friends as collaborators and across the board as as better musicians but better musicians in very different ways than a sort of a standard course of musical training where the trained musicians train the non-musicians or the neurotypical people use music to model appropriate behaviors for other kinds of social interaction or academic skills or whatever that's done and there's lots of you know benefit i'm sure that that has come from it and that come, can come from it within a sort of more conventional music therapeutic model but that's not really what i've been about i'm an ethnographer i'm an anthropologist i'm a musician i'm a musicologist and so my idea is just like when i go to bali and i'm working with you know the very finest balinese gamelan musicians on the planet um i go in there with an attitude of I'm here to see what's going on. I'm here to see what makes you tick. I'm here to see how how you make it work in a musical setting. And ultimately, I, I'm curious to see how all of those interactions, all of the music that comes out of it, all of the kind of formal designs and structural designs within the music tell me something about, you know, the map of culture, the way people interact with each other. The sort of the dynamics of social interaction, the ideas of relationships between natural and non-natural worlds, between the physical and the metaphysical. I mean, all of that, you know, and, and so basically my job is to observe all of that, to be a part of it if they invite me on whatever terms I'm allowed to, um, to sort of build those relationships and, and ultimately to come out of that maybe in a way that I can help to sort of leverage that music those stories those people's perspectives and narratives and and i see what i do in the artism space or in the ewop space or or whatever or or playing you know felonious monks music with matt savage is kind of the same um i'm there to to learn and to listen and to contribute as i can but ultimately the expertise is the expertise resides in, in 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 people other than myself because what we're interested in here is is a kind of an autistic cognitive style and an autistic musicianship that you know at its most profound level has completely revolutionized the world of music if if as matt savage and i are sort of exploring um felonious monk was operating from an autistic position of musicality um this isn't you know this isn't established fact for those of you who are watching this is uh, a theory and development. Um, well, Thelonious Monk, what made him unique was perhaps that autistic cognitive style, which is why people can sound like Charlie Parker and they can sound like John Coltrane and they can sound like Dizzy Gillespie and Bud Powell and Art Tatum, but nobody seems to be able to sound like Monk. My theory, Matt seems to, you know, be developing the theory with me is that autism had something to do with that. And if we are to work on that assumption that there's some validity to that theory and that argument, and if we are to work on the established fact that Thelonious Monk completely transformed not just the genre of jazz music as we know it in the 20th century, but by extension, the entire concept of what music in the 20th century and beyond was and is, then autism has revolutionized music. And that doesn't even get us into all the other, you know, Bartok and, 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 and many other important composers, Mozart perhaps too, 
who in sort of these retrospective games that we tend to play of, of who might have been autistic might also have fallen on the spectrum had they been born in different times. Actually, well, one more yeah. question. Uh, do you have, um, is the music that you create for the, the Artism Project, is that available online or, or is it public? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, some of it is that like the, the video that I just showed you and there are a couple of others. It, it, if you go to the, the companion website to my book, the Music on Autism book, um, several artism examples are, are there. Um, and then also music and poetry and, and writing by by all the other people in the book as well. Okay, um, great. Thank you. I can send you a, a link to that as well if you want. Oh yeah, that'd be great. I'd like to share that. Thank you. Okay, cool. Also, it's a joy to be your friend and um, it's Likewise. easy to have insight because I I feel your life as it if, as if it's my own. So it's, wow. It's easy to um, it's easy to feel you. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank likewise. You so much, and what a great time we had together. Uh, thank you so much for coming, Michael. And let's be in touch about the future. And this is going to make sure. a great video. Okay, well, it's so, a pleasure and an honor always to to share space with all of you. And thank you.